are going to speak about fear of failure as we're wrapping up this month on fear no more. Now, I know right out of the gate, when I say fear of failure, there's two groups of people. The that's not me's and the that's me's, okay? So if that isn't you, congratulations for feeling that way. We're going to look at nine common signs of of things that you struggle with if you do have a fear of failure. For those of you who know that is you, congratulations, you made it today. This is going to be a good day for you. So before we even read the first verse, I'm going to do something a little different. Um, We're going to just, by faith, claim freedom and healing today before we even get into the scripture. So we're going to get a little Catholic. Stand back up with me. You're going to get your leg workout in today. <clears throat> so we know, right, that we know that God takes our best and makes it something powerful and beautiful, right? We know that. So I'm believing that I'm going to give you the word that I feel God has asked me to give to you today, but no matter what happens up here, if you have come here today to receive him, receive his spirit, receive healing and freedom, it has nothing to do with what's set up here on stage. The spirit is going to do his work regardless of what I do. So let's just pray real quick. Every, every eye closed, please. Father, I just ask right now for open hearts, open ears, honesty. Father, that we let you in. We know you're in this place. We know that we're going to be reading from your divine word today. But it's on us to let you in and to choose you today, Father. So God, we just choose you this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before you sit down. I actually, just just go with me. I left a front row, the front row reserved, right? So there are some of you that right now, already, you're like, shoot, this this one's me. I didn't want to, I should have stayed home. We argued anyways, I shouldn't have come. If you know this is you, or if over the past few weeks that you have not stepped out when you felt you should get prayer or or act on it. I've got eight more seats <laughs> down front. This is your chance. This is your first chance today to say no to the fear of failure, to the fear of looking weird, to the fear of not being understood. There's six more seats. There's five more seats down front. Do not miss this opportunity. Do not miss this. I'm going to keep going. Everyone's going to sit. It's going to make it even harder to go if you waited, but you should still come. So go ahead and take your seats. There's still two more seats up front. Do not miss this opportunity today. Here we go. Today we're going to be talking about not only the fear of failure, but the life of Moses. There's more seats. Right here. Right here. The second row seats. It's the act of faith. It doesn't matter where you sit. It's that you got up and came down. It doesn't matter where you sit. There's more seats right there. It doesn't matter where. All right. That's not me's. Let's get into it. This is why it is you. Nine signs that you might have a fear of failure. I'm getting, look, I'm getting the practicals and like the notes out of the way so Pastor Peter accepts this as a real sermon because I have multiple points. Otherwise, tonight at family night is going to be like, didn't make it. <clears throat> Do you ever worry about what other people might think of you? <laughs> Good. Do you ever, well now I am, so. Uh, Do you ever worry that people will lose interest in you? Do you ever worry about disappointing people whose opinion you value? This could even be strangers. People at home, online, you are not exempt from this. Get up, move seats in the house. I don't know what that looks like for you, but you are not exempt from participating today and receiving today. Are you worried about the opinions of strangers? Because I do. Uh, Do you ever worry about going after a dream or desire that's in your heart because you think, I don't know if I can do that or not. You dream of it and you never do it. Do you ever worry that people will think you aren't smart or competent? Hello? Uh, If you fail, you are confirming it. Have you ever told someone that you don't expect something to succeed before you even start? I'm triggered by this one. In order to lower their expectations. Do you ever get last minute headaches, stomach aches, or other physical ailments while preparing to do something you feel is important to the point where you can't even do it? You can't even participate. You're out before you even get a chance. 
Do you ever repeatedly get distracted, this is ridiculous, <clears throat> by things that prevent you from completing your goal? Things that weren't as urgent as they seemed at the time. I think I cleaned every stupid thing in our house this week. Do you tend to procrastinate and run out of time when you have to prepare for something? Never. Fear of failure keeps you from being what God's called you to be. Failing is an important piece of our relationship with Christ. I'm going to get into this a little bit more later, but for me, a fear of failure has always been present. It's always played a role in my life. Like I struggle with this even to this day, but only like seven of these nine, so I'm basically healed. So that's cool. No, this is pretty much just something God's telling me to get over and you all get to listen to it. But seriously, I procrastinate and, and I put stuff off and I don't try because I'm worried about failing. I've always been this way. And I learned early on, if I don't try my hardest, I have an excuse. If I sabotage this thing, I'm scared of failing, I can say, well, of course it failed. I didn't, I, I, I barely tried. Of course it failed. I knew it was going to fail. I just wanted to do this to show you guys I could do something. You know, whatever. You have that excuse left over in your head because you didn't try all the way. You don't give it your all. It led me to not giving my all at anything. Relationships, my walk with Christ, my jobs, my relationship with my wife, at all of it suffered because I was afraid of failing. Just never giving my all led to such, uh, so many missed opportunities. So many, so many passions that I might have loved that I, that I don't know about. So many people that might be my best friends right now, but I was scared to go take a step. That's why I'm going to give you four truths to remember when you are fearful. Now, I'm warning you, these are very obvious, very on the nose, Almost cliche, okay? <clears throat> Here's the deal with these, though. When you're, when, you're, when you're, like, in the midst of being stricken with fear, and when you are struggling, when you are not knowing which way to turn, you do not need some long, lengthy, intricate verse. You need something simple that you can hold on to, that you can repeat over and over to yourself, and that you're going to be able to recall when this fear strikes. So laugh if you will, because they're simple, but here we go. Four truths to remember that will reduce the fear of failure in your life. Everyone fails in many ways, so don't be so proud to think it's only you. Like, what do, you, what do we think the Ten Commandments are? They're proof that we can't do it. They are proof that we need a savior. So I'll give a simple example. Let's look at professional sports. Baseball players. When they go, when they're at bat, right? So they get their little bat and they walk out and the guy's going to throw it at them. If they hit the ball three out of every ten times, they are one of the greatest players in the world. They make like $300 million a year. Like, it's insane. 70% failure rate, greatest in the world. LeBron James. Some say he's the greatest. I will... I don't, he can pass all the records he wants. He's not the greatest. It's fine. We can talk about that later. I'll pray for you because you're deceived. Uh, he misses. He, he's the greatest in the world because he makes like 50% of his shots. Maybe slightly more than that. Every other shot the guy takes, he misses. Greatest in the world. It, how, how high are your standards for yourself? It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. The people you're aspiring to be fail so often. Number two, no failure is final unless you give up. Obvious, right? But listen, failure is over in a second, and it's pretty often that you get to try again. There's very few things in life that you don't get to try again, but that fear of failure will haunt you days, weeks, years. I mean, I'm sure there are people right here that have been talking for years this is not me, about going back to school and finishing up the degree that they never got. But for some reason, they're afraid. They're going to look stupid. They're, gonna, they're not going to be able to do it. Who cares? They, every one of you has someone that you look up to that got there by failing over and over again. And because of your fear, there's someone that can't look up to you. 
There is someone around you that needs to be able to admire you, but because of your fear, you're not allowing that to happen. Failure is the path to success if you're humble and willing to learn from it. Failure and pain make you humble. But that's not a reason to be afraid of it. Look at who God used in the scriptures. When you've been extended grace from God and by the people around you, it is so much easier to extend grace to others. Nobody wants someone in their small circle that succeeds every single time, never had anything go wrong. They're just, they're miserable to be around. We love them, God, keep blessing them, but it's miserable. And number four, the one that should bring you the most peace, remember, no matter what happens, God promises to use this for your good. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Do not be afraid because failure is not the end. It is just one sentence in your testimony. That's it. It's just one line. God's going to use that. My failures are what God uses to show his glory and his grace and his goodness. The biggest thing that you can do to defeat fear of failure is to know that you're loved. We have to know that God loves us and that all things God is going to work for the good of those who love him. Pastor Rick Warren said that we need to stop calling it failure and start calling it an education and that some of us are highly educated. (laughs) He also tells his staff to fail weekly and then come back and talk about it at the next meeting. They have a saying in his office, it is, I want to get it right, fail fast, fail often, and fail cheap. (laughs) And I love that, just mainly the fail cheap part. But he wants to be sure that people are pushing themselves and pushing one another. He said that he's never fired anyone for failing, but he has fired lots of people for not learning from their failure and for not taking a risk, just being comfortable their whole time. Okay, we, we're gonna get into Exodus 4. All of it, <laughs> okay? Now, I follow a lot of you on the Bible app. We're about to go through more scripture than you read in your devos in three weeks, okay? I love you, but let's just be honest. We're gonna, we're gonna get through some scripture today. But I love the life of Moses because he screwed up way more than me. And it's encouraging to see how God keeps using him. Here's the other thing. Everyone's like, the miracles that he did, this guy was terrified. Every time, look at, you're going to watch the lengths God went through to get this guy to say yes to anything. It's amazing. This guy was terrified. So let's jump into this. Moses answered, what if... Because this is what people say all the time. What if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Is that not what we ask all the time? Like, we think, that's not from God. God wouldn't tell, God did not tell me that. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. It's like the first thing he got right in this whole story. We learned from Pastor Peter a few weeks ago that a staff represents what? Protection and safety, Right? There's a little something extra in it for Moses because before he became a shepherd, he murdered someone in Egypt. Then he fled and was taken in and now he's a shepherd. And so this guy's career is staring at his failures and what he ran away from. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. You're not my dad, that's a staff. It's a silly video for any of you who know it. I'm embarrassed. Uh, Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake. Nope. And he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Who? I would... No, I don't do snakes. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. See how God gave him a baby step? Just something little. It was just in your hand. Just grab it again. It's gonna be fine. He's increasing his faith little by little. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. 
Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak. When he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. All right, something interesting this time. He didn't run this time. He didn't freak out. He didn't scream. He didn't wave his hand around. Not that it's written. But his faith is already building a little bit. Now look at this next part. Verse 8. Then the Lord said, I should probably get you there. Then the Lord said, if you do not believe, if they do not believe or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. I'm sorry. May? Does he not know how this, is God not outside of time? He knows how this is going to go. I love the use of vague terms here. <clears throat> Nine, but if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. God gave him assurance. He didn't even have to prove this miracle. His faith's already growing. He didn't even have to prove it. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent. If you're not eloquent, don't use the word eloquent. Okay? <laughs> Neither in the past, here we go, nor since you've spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. I like how he said, listen, this whole time we've been talking, you haven't fixed anything. You did the snake, you did the, fix my words. Like, you want me to go? I'm going to go. But let's bargain. Go ahead and fix my speech. Take this insecurity. Take my fear away. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? God basically saying, boy, shut up. Now go, I will make you speak and will teach you what to say. I will help you speak and teach you what to say. Put his mind at ease yet again. Verse 13, important one. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. This guy, after the snake, after the hand in the coat, he, he said, please send someone else. After the, knowing that if he pours water on the ground, it's going to turn into blood. He was so afraid of what the Israelites, not even Pharaoh at this point, he's still talking about going to talk to his own people in Egypt. This is his tribe. He's so afraid of failing and being called out or being made to speak in front of people, he's so insecure that after all of these miracles, he says, please don't, please don't send me. I can't do this. Send someone else. Guys, we have, this is us. I don't, I don't know if you've put those two together or not yet. This is us. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We have an entire book of God's promises God asked us to speak to a coworker. We're like, oh, please don't send me. Please send someone else. Incredible, incredible. The fear of failure is crippling us. 14, the Lord's anger burned against Moses. He said, what about your brother, Aaron the Levite? Basically, 14 through 16, he said, go get your brother. Verses 17, <clears throat> But take the staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. Okay, stand there once you get there, but you gotta go. It's basically what they've negotiated to. 18, Moses went back to his father-in-law and said to him, let me return to my own people in Egypt and see if they are still alive. Jethro said, go, I wish you well. Basically, I've got three miracles locked and loaded. Everybody that wanted to kill me, probably not even there anymore, I can go now. Now the Lord said to Moses, go back to Egypt for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife, his sons, put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. He took the staff of God in his hand and the Lord said to Moses, once you return, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. I love God's timing. He waits till he gets the family packed up, loaded up, on the donkey, on the way, 
because if Moses was anything like me, by the time I get that freaking car loaded and all the last minute bags that are like, I didn't know we owned this much stuff is jammed in the car, I'm going wherever God tells me to go. I'm not unpacking the car. Like, and, I, and he's on a donkey. Like, that's awful. So I love that God's like, wait till he gets a little further. And then he's like, hey, heads up. Pharaoh's not going to let him go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go he, so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. 24, one of the weirdest verses in the Bible. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Not his wife. I thought his wife would have killed him first. Um, let me explain their culture a little bit. So, Moses' culture, they circumcise their children on the eighth day after birth. His wife's culture, they circumcise uh, when they're betrothed to get married. So, isn't that a fun little, let's, let's get married. Um, but Moses' son, at this point, wasn't circumcised. And whether it was because Moses didn't want to cause his son the pain didn't care enough, his wife didn't want him to, which based on the rest of the scripture, I don't think that was the one. Or he was just afraid to confront his father-in-law say, and say, thank you for letting me stay with you and saving my life. I'm raising my son as God's chosen people. I'm doing it this way, the way that I feel God's told me to do. He didn't do that. I think it was because he was afraid to do it. He was just afraid to, to step out in that. Here's the problem though, guys. God is a jealous God. And we tend to have a much higher assessment of our importance to God's plan coming to fruition than is probably accurate. Right? Like, the prophecies of the Old Testament, they will be fulfilled. Christ will open the scrolls. You can be a part of it or not, but Christ is returning. That's completely up to you. And like Pastor Mark said several weeks ago, God loves you enough to leave you out of his plan if you want to be left out. So here we see Moses putting his son and his wife above what God told him to do. After all the convincing, God had set all this stuff up in order to get Moses to go, for him to be the mouthpiece, for him to go. All the, the life in Egypt, the basket down the river as he was a babe, like all this stuff, God said, no, you're not going to listen, you're out. I'll kill you and find somebody else. God will use the obedient over the disobedient, no matter how many steps have been put into place. God cares about our character and our heart. He wasn't going to leave his chosen people in Egypt, whether Moses listened or not. Very important. <laughs> but Zipporah, 25, took a flint knife and cut off her son's foreskin and touched it to Moses' feet. Surely you are the bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord left him alone. They say they think actually Moses was completely unconscious. That the Lord had actually struck him down and he was unconscious. At a, they were at an inn when this happened. Um, so that's why she circumcised her son and touched it to his feet. Listen, this is just another of many examples of a woman's obedience and sensitivity to God deferring his anger and keeping everything on track. Like, it is honestly offensively a little bit too much in the Bible. Like, they save the day so often, just in my opinion. <clears throat> so, women, wives, mothers, be, just be honest and upfront with your husbands. Like, be sensitive to God's voice and ruthless with following it. And men, I'm sorry, I'm saying it. If your wife tells you that she heard from the Lord, you'd better freaking listen. There's a very good chance it'll save your life. Maybe not your physical life, but your spiritual life. Your relational life. They are much more sensitive to God in general than we are. Okay, 27 through 31. Moses and Aaron meet. They go in the desert. The Israelites believe them. All the fear didn't even need to go through all of that. They immediately believed them and accepted them as their representatives. 
All right, we are done with the dissection of Exodus 4. You guys can take a breath. You made it. If you never take a risk, you don't need any faith. Do not let your fear make you unfaithful. Hebrews 11, 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Don't let your fear make you unfaithful. God is far more interested in your character than your contributions and your success rate or your batting average. Are you more concerned with what other people think than you are if God can use you? Like, really? And stop asking what's gonna happen if I fail and ask, do I want God to use me? Can I be used today? Can I push the fear away and listen to God and be used today or not? Because he has something for you to do each day. If you don't, someone else will. But I wanna be sensitive and push my fear to the side and listen to God. Can I have my helper come up? Here he is. All right, people at home, eat your hearts out. Zoom in on this guy. Who's my big strong boy? Yeah, you are? All right, show him your muscles real quick. Just real quick. Show him this. Show him the guns. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo! Oh, my goodness. Okay, Levi's going to help me with something. So, head's on a swivel. He's going to be throwing something. (laughs) Hands up. Let me see some alertness. Good. Okay. Levi, we talked about this earlier. I asked you to throw it over the audience, right? And what did you say you're just going to go ahead and do? Throw it in the hoop. He said he's just going to go ahead and throw it in the hoop. Um, I love it. I love it. And I think you can can do your best. You ready? So what he's going to do, Levi, there's a cord in the way. So let's move a little bit over. I don't want that thing to stop your throw. See that back there? You need to go to the left of that. Okay, this kid's got a frickin' cannon, so heads up, two rows back. Here we go. This is the ball. Okay, take a few steps. I'll be here so you don't fall. Take a few steps, and I want you to throw it in the hoop. Ready? Big throw, big throw. Whoa! Good job. Come here. Good job. You didn't make it, did you? No, it's okay. Was that your best? That was your best, wasn't it? Dad is proud of you. Who's my special boy? Me. Good. The point isn't always the task that you think you're going to fail at. Most of the time, this is the point. The knowing that I don't, at the end of the day, I don't care how far he throws the ball. He listened and he trusted his daddy and he threw it. And I think he did a great job. This is the point. It's not about God tells you to do something. It's about you and God and the faith that it takes to do that thing. But if you are afraid, you cannot be faithful. And you're missing this. And this is what it's all about. I almost asked the online people to put in the comments what are the chances I was going to cry, but then I didn't because I knew it would be 100. (laughs) Again, the biggest thing that you can do to defeat fear is know that you're loved. And you are loved. We need to change our mindset and realize that, that this, that our next step is going to be the thing that shows how great God is. Give your best effort, throw the ball, and see what God can do with it. His love should cast out all fear. If it doesn't, do you really understand the love of God? Thank you, Levi. Give him a hand. Just one reason that the word of God is so powerful is that it, it takes 
over and over again, it takes failure and uses it to glorify God. But if you never take a step, if you're afraid to fail, you're choosing not to participate in glorifying God in this way. God promises that no matter what you go through, you will stand in the end with him. No failure, no shortcoming, no rejection can stop God from loving you. By his grace, by his strength to glorify him, you will stand in the end. And we have to believe this. Now, can you please stand with me? Do not let your testimony go stale. Take a risk. Build your faith. Fail. Find the love of God. Now, what we're going to do right now is I'm actually, we don't do these too much anymore, but I, if this is you, I want you to come down front. If you need prayer for this, if you need prayer for one of the past three weeks of fear that you're, that you didn't have the strength or the courage to step out in, come down front and I'm gonna pray for you right now. There's someone standing out there right now going, I wanna go, but people are gonna see me walk forward. Good. We don't think less of you, we think the opposite. We see you pursuing God. That's what we wanna see. That's what we've been praying to see. Elijah was utterly defeated and ran into the wilderness to give up and die. But God provided a way. He nursed him. He let it, helped him push through his fear. Samson had failed at literally every chance he got. Like every decision he could have made wrong, he checked that box. And at the end, he was enslaved. His eyes were gouged out. He was chained to a pillar for entertainment, but God did not let him live in that failure. He used him one last time in a mighty way. Peter, while standing on the water in the middle of a miracle, like he was in the middle of his miracle, became afraid and wouldn't walk any closer. But Christ reached out and grabbed him and raised him up yet again. The thief hanging on the cross next to Jesus. Who was he to speak up and ask to be remembered? Everything in him must have been saying, shut up. You're hanging on a cross, you failure. Don't talk to him. But Christ said, I will remember you. Psalm 73, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I'm gonna pray for everybody down front right now and everyone in here, but especially those of you who acted on what you felt the Spirit was pulling you to do. Father, I just speak right now that everyone in this place and especially those down front, Father, that we draw strength from knowing that we are loved. Father, that we will not stand for being stagnant anymore. God, that we are not going to miss an opportunity to grow closer to you because we're afraid. Father, I pray that you reach into every heart and that you just remind us of your love, remind us of your provision, remind us of all the times that you've already saved us and that we have nothing to fear. Father, speak to us right now. We tell fear to leave in the name of Jesus. Right now, if this is you, I want you to speak it out. That fear you leave in the name of Jesus. You have no place in my home. You have no place in my relationship. You have no place in my children. You have no place in my heart. You leave now in the name of Jesus. Father, I want to pray a blessing for everyone in here right now. Father, let us, let us not be afraid to build our testimony. To take a risk. To show your glory with what you can do with our best efforts, which we know are not good enough. Father, we just ask for your spirit to fill every person in this place. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray.